Welcome back to Two Nobodies, everyone. Today we have another special guest for you. His name is Dr. James Cahill. He's a professor at the Department of Biological Sciences. Dr. Cahill says that we can call him JC, and that's uh, that works for me if that works for Dr. Cahill, and uh, we're just excited to have him. Uh, we have been just a little bit of a premise for the episode. Um, Kyle and I have had conversations about, uh, you know, plants and our understanding of how they can cooperate with each other and just the fascination about if they communicate and how they behave. And so we've been looking for somebody who we can talk to about this. And I think JC might be that person. So uh, JC, welcome to Two Nobody, Nobodies. It's a pleasure to have you today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Um, maybe just a little bit about your story, because it's interesting. I, I think I'm very curious on how you even got started in this research. Uh, I, I, first of all, I didn't even know it was a thing until I started hearing about it this past year. But if you don't mind a little bit of your story, is it also like in your childhood? Is this something that you just were fascinated about plants? Like, is there a linkage that's kind of deep buried back then? Or what's the connection? No, <laughs> there, there isn't. Um, okay. I, 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 uh, the long story is I, I'm from the U.S. originally, um, and, and that's where I did all of my schooling. And as an undergraduate, I went to a small liberal arts college, and I was a philosophy major who was going to go to medical school. So that was what I came in wanting mm -hmm. to do. And I got into the lab of a wonderful mentor who was doing research on green algae on the coast of Connecticut, and I got to spend a couple summers just walking up and down the coast of this beautiful area, collecting some samples and uh, trying to get them to grow so we could identify them. And I realized one day out there, this is a job. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like this, is, this, isn't, this isn't just a summer hobby. Like this could be a career. Um, and um, I naively decided that I wanted to be a professor and mm -hmm. I went to uh, graduate school in Philadelphia and somehow it worked out. And I've been here in 1999 and I've, really moved into this world of plant behavior in the last decade or two, uh, but I've dabbled with it ever since graduate school. But it, it's it's coming of age now, and I'm happy to be part of that. How how novel is this field? Like, so you said you started about 1999, but were, were you one of those originators, or, or had the field been established quite a bit, or what did that look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny one. Um, so my PhD supervisor, Brenda Casper, and I did a couple papers in graduate school. So that would have been about 92, 94. Um, and it wasn't called plant behavior. It was called plant mm -hmm. plasticity. Uh, and so plasticity is if an organism can adopt more than one form based on conditions. And you couldn't call it behavior. Um, like if you tried, it would never get published. And so we published a bunch of the early work on plant plasticity, particularly in the soil. In other words, how plants find food. And so if, if it was an animal, we'd just call it foraging, but it was plants, we couldn't use that terminology, and went away with that. And then I came back to the field when I was now tenured, older, maybe a little more confident, and less willing to put up with arbitrary decisions. And so I just start using the word plant behavior, and what are they going to do? <laughs> um, and, and if I can justify it with data... Um, right. and, and, and that's what's happened. And so I and a few other people have really said, let's not say plants are like animals. Let's realize that the great models and ideas of animal behavior that have been developed, they actually explain how plants live their lives. And so by ignoring behavioral ecology of plants, it's like trying to understand humans without even considering the possibility of behavior. It just makes no sense. And so for me, it's more than just a fight that I want behavior out there. Um, it's useful. It opens up a whole body of understanding that works. Unbelievable. So it uh, sounds to me like a lot of the work that you're doing is, is seminal or, you know, has been seminal. Is that accurate? Yeah, I've, I've come in at a few points that have been pretty critical I've, um, to, and made some some significant advancements that have moved the field in certain ways, but it's a lot, you know, I won't say there's a lot of people who have done that, but there are, it's definitely more than me and I don't want to overstate my importance, but uh, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've helped push the field and, and we've written some papers, not just on data, but more on the ideas and concepts and trying to lay an intellectual foundation of the discipline. Um, and it's, it's very different than traditional plant biology, which has been critical 
to produce food. I mean, like, like we wouldn't be around with, without the great advancements of classical plant sciences, but they never looked at these types of questions and never even asked the questions. And so this, it's as though this whole other half of plant biology has only opened up in the last decade. Unbelievable. Which yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, we've used plants forever. One of the um, best jobs I ever had was as a uh, field assistant, actually with the University of Alberta, um, and I got to hike around uh, the Canmore area and basically look for pine beetle. And I got paid, it wasn't much, it was like $1,400 a month, I think. But that was easily the best job I ever had. Um, and so for somebody who spent so much time in academia and so much time doing research, and I'm assuming so much time in the field, I'd like to know what the best field job you ever had is and then what the worst field job you ever had was. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a hardcore field biologist anymore. I, I, there was a time I was. Um, uh, my, my, my spouse is. Um, she's at U of A too, and she's actually in the field right now. Um, and I, I've done a lot of field work. I, my graduate students all do the field work. I'm old. I got bad knees. And um, a lot of the behavioral work we do actually needs to be in the greenhouse right now because it's still very proof of concept. And so I need to manage field crews and greenhouse crews and all of that combined. Um, that said, I also took a different path where I never went to the best place for field research. Um, I always decided to live, uh, to work near home. I had my first son when I was still in graduate school. And I knew at the time I had to make a life choice about whether I wanted to go to these really beautiful remote places to do my research or did I want to be able to drive an hour outside of Philadelphia and be able to come home at night? Uh, and, and so I did that then. And then I had another son here in Edmonton. And, and I've been very fortunate to be able to do most of my research at the University of Alberta ranches, uh, the one in particular at Kinsella Ranch. Um, it's an hour and a half away. And it, it really makes that life balance better. And I don't regret it at all. I love grasslands. It's a beautiful place. Uh, the, 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 the team who runs the ranch have been super helpful. So I haven't had I haven't had those field experiences, um, but the worst ones, you know, I I haven't really had like a lot of what we do in science is horrible, like it's just awful work. Um, I study mostly processes that happen in the soil, which means we're digging holes, thousands of soil cores in a day or a week, and then we're washing the roots out. So I've spent countless numbers in front of a sink separating soil from roots, and all every student coming through. So. The field work, you know, it's pretty, but then the, the rest is the, the stuff that's not so fun sure. for me. My students hate it when I say that, though, just to be clear. <laughs> they, they totally disagree. <laughs> uh, so how much of your work right now is, is, I, is uh, teaching versus research? What's that balance look like? Yeah, so right now the, uh, in biological sciences, our normal teaching responsibilities for a research professor, which is what I am rather than an instructor, is two classes a year. So very light. Um, I teach a plant ecology class in the fall, and I teach a, uh, I'm teaching a plant-animal interactions course right now, which are both great classes. Um, and I used to teach introductory ecology and a lot of grad classes. It just varies year to year. But the other part of our teaching is I have four undergraduates in my lab right now who are all doing their own projects, that I'm all, and they're all formally in courses. And I have another f five graduate students, and I'm supervising or mentoring them in their program. So we do... There's so much teaching that happens outside of a course um, that it looks like we don't always teach a lot if we teach two courses. But, you know, I've trained 150 H high, highly qualified personnel in the last 20 years have come through my lab. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've hired 60, I've given 65 summer jobs to undergraduates and, 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 and in jobs during the year. And so that volume is there, but it's, it's research driven um, rather than just courtroom instruction. I was just uh, thinking about the plant behavior piece. If if no one, I mean, I, I can't imagine that the general population probably even knows that such a thing maybe even exists or is very familiar with it. But I guess for maybe as a naive question, but like, why should somebody even care? Like, why should somebody care about this field of research? I, I think it's a great question. And um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I, I happened to be part of a documentary a few years ago on this. There was a documentary on uh, nature of things that was called smarty plants and it was also <laughs> sold to uh P pbs in the united states and it was aired in their who came up with show. the pun was I that you the name of 
<laughs> not me. No, no. I'm. I was. I was just a talent. <laughs> um, and, and so I was. I was the lead scientist on that one. Um, and then, <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, you can Google it. You'll see it. But um, in, in, in PBS and Nature, it's called What Plants Talk About. And like, why do we care? It gets posted to YouTube occasionally. One of the postings I saw, it's been viewed over two million times on on YouTube. Um, and so a lot of people care about what plants are doing um, for just general knowledge or um, there's a, a lot of cultural, uh, a lot of what I talk about actually overlaps with a lot of cultural traditions that I wasn't aware of, uh, but different perspectives of nature and how organisms interact with the world um, outside of the traditional Western mindset that I, I grew up in. And so it resonates with people, many people in that way. Um, and then there's the, also the application side. And so if we think about an agricultural system, uh, we've bred plants through the Green Revolution basically to not grow as many roots and to grow more f fruits or, or, or whatever we harvest and to be dependent on high inputs of stuff. And so really we have done a really good job at turning plants into factories. If we give them the raw products, they'll convert them to the, what we want that will then can you know, feed the world. Um, and that's not a trivial thing. But what we never did is ask the question is, what can the plant do for itself? Um, what if we actually learn how a plant finds and captures food in the soil? If it can find small patches of food, well, why are we spraying fertilizer everywhere? In fact, most of the time, if a plant can concentrate its roots in a small area, it has higher yield, it has higher fitness. And imagine if we don't have to do broadcast spraying of fertilizer. That means there's gonna be more nutrients taken up by plants, the crop plants, not the weeds. There'll be less runoff, less mm -hmm. pollution. And so by uh, what we're hoping is by understanding what plants are capable of and figuring out the best way to encourage the plants to behave the way we need them to, um, we can actually uh, be more efficient and, and probably more sustainable in many systems. And that's just in the cropland side, but but also just general biodiversity, which is a big part of my research, is we've always assumed that plants just fight, fight, fight. And if you have two plants together, there's always gonna be one. But it's like looking at your neighbor. Just because you're your neighbor doesn't mean one of you is gonna move away. You, you might, it might be completely antagonistic, or you cooperate, or you ignore each other. You have all mm. of these behavioral decisions that can moderate that interaction. And that changes our thinking of the world from inherently competitive to one of behavioral choice that has a variety of possible outcomes. And this is, yeah, that, that for me is very interesting because this is where, um, uh, you know, I heard, I heard Michael Pollan talk about this in, on, a, on a podcast where he said that plants tend to cooperate rather than com uh, compete. And I, I, that might have just been a general statement and maybe that doesn't apply to every plant. But to me, in terms of like, what does that mean for humans and how we should evolve? Because we've always talked about uh, you know, think about uh, Darwin's theory, right, of evolution and how survival of the fittest kind of thing, right, and how we all need to compete to survive and, 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 and that sort of thing. And it's like, well, maybe the plants actually have it right rather than the way we are actually functioning with each other. Yeah, it's it's really tricky. I, I actually am, I was just working before the podcast on my abstract for the um, Canadian Society of Ecology meeting that's coming up in August. Um, and I'm actually... A, getting at this topic of like, have we overblown the role of competition in, in ecological understanding and plant biology? And, and what does it mean? And I find it really tricky. What a lot of plant ecology, which is, I'm a plant ecologist, this comes from a agricultural tradition. So that really is the dominant science branch that merged into plant ecology. And that really is this plants as factories idea. And it's really focused on resources. Uh, and so the, there's a real focus on light and nitrogen and water. And if we're focusing just on those resources, it's really easy to think about it like a game where somebody's gonna take more than somebody else and it's inherently antagonistic. What we don't focus on as much is what else is happening with somebody living next to you? It's casting a little bit of shade. That, that might be less photons of light. It also might reduce your temperature so you have less heat stress. Mm -hmm. And yes, that plant next to you is taking up some water, but what if it's exuding some chemicals that are actually liberating phosphorus and increasing soil fertility? And so yeah. we focused only on the one most antagonistic part of living together, but there's all these other ways that species interact, be they plants or animals. And it's this whole web of interactions that really tells what the outcome 
of living with neighbors is going to be. And sometimes it is going to be deeply competitive and one plant will kill another. That absolutely happens. And other times they don't. Um, and it's trying to understand why and when is, is what really we're trying to do. I was to reading do. about an example. Oh, sorry, Rupesh. Um, about uh, yeah. corn plants and how they can communicate through chemicals uh, via their root systems. Um, and I was surprised to hear that oftentimes, and I'll probably get this wrong, so just bear with me, but oftentimes um, they'll actually uh, communicate to encourage their corn plant neighbors to grow more aggressively in the face of other sort of um, uh, combating plants or um, competitive plants in the area. And that sort of surprised me a little bit. Um, and so I guess that's where some of that cooperation comes out. And I just assumed that it was, I suppose, to help encourage growth so that uh, that limits the amount of resources available to non-corn plants. But if you know that example, or um, like, is there a general walkthrough as to the currently understood logic behind why a plant would encourage another plant of its species to, to um, start to grow more aggressively and, and um, use those resources? Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a really good question. And um, there's a number of studies that are showing that we call them exudates. These are the chemicals that are coming out of a root and they're really complicated types of chemicals. It's not just one thing. Some of them are hormones, some of them are a variety of other things. And those exudates are biologically active, both for other plant roots, but also for the microbes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's, it changes the fungi and the bacteria. And some of these chemicals will harm other plants. So they're allele chemicals, we, um, so they have a negative effect on other plants. Other, than, other of them seem to be signals that the other plants perceive, translate into action that can cause a response like you're talking about. And so we call that general class something called an induced response. So the plant changes its chemistry or its behavior based on information that it receives. So the question you're asking is a very good one. You're living next to other plants. Why would you help your neighbor? Like why actually let that plant grow more vigorous and, and um, uh, be more competitive? That could harm you. If we actually think about plants in nature, not croplands, uh, but plants in nature, and you think about a, a maternal plant is full of seeds most of those seeds are always gonna fall at her feet. It doesn't matter if she's wind dispersed or animal dispersed, the vast majority of her offspring will be very, very close to mom. And what that means is most of your neighbors are gonna be your siblings, your half siblings. So most plants of the are surrounded by individuals that are closely related. And there's all sorts of examples in animal biology of kin selection and, and, and taking risk to help kin. And so it's not a straight me versus them. It's we're all the same family. And so the evolutionary dynamics got complicated. That is so interesting to me that like they can recognize um, like um, there are others or like all the members of their community and sort of help them along. And, you know, I'm an idiot who's like paraphrasing here probably incorrectly. But that concept to me is just absolutely intriguing. It's unbelievable. It, it, it's amazing what's going out there. And I'll just add two other things. The other thing to consider is maybe a plant doesn't want to help its neighbor, but maybe natural selection has made that plant a really good eavesdropper. And so there's lots of evidence of that too, is that if this plant is producing a signal, there might be selection on other plants to evolve the ability to decode it and use it for their own benefit. So it doesn't have to help the emitter, it can help the decoder. And the other one just on this is there's lots of examples of many species of plants that can identify their kin from strangers. And, and so they, some species do have the ability to say, this is a close relative, this is a stranger of the same species, and they act differently depending on who they're next to. So Crazy. cool. The example, you, the example you gave, you said was kind of like in nature, but so how does this differ for, like, as you said, plants that are kind of built for factories or monoculture plants? Do you, would you generally see maybe more competition or uh, is it hard to generalize, but what does that behavior look like compared to plants in nature, I suppose? Yeah, this is a very big area of research globally right now, is, is trying to bring plant behavior into the cropland system. And um, we're doing a little bit here with wheat, um, and, but I, I know lots of groups around the world at the big research, agricultural institutions really working on this. And there's two sort of starting points that we don't have answers for. First uh, is, did we accidentally breed behavior out of plants during the Green Revolution? 
And so it's possible because we did have these breeding programs that were nurturing the plants with all the inputs, we would have nece not necessarily ever seen the benefits of individual behavior because they didn't need to do it. And so it's possible unintentionally we've caused the loss of the ability to do some of these uh, communication below ground, but also above ground for recruiting um, uh, predators of your herbivores and all these things. And so that's one line of research and that's classic evolutionary biology with pedigrees of crop plants and looking to see behavior, um, how it's changed over time. And then the second one is, so what? What types of behaviors can we uh, use that might enhance crop production or increase sustainability or reduce costs? So these are all different aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ones that's being targeted early is, we know a lot of uh, crop plants and other plants produce volatile chemicals, so chemicals that are gaseous at ambient temperatures that are signals for animals. Uh, and some of these signals actually are received by predators um, so predatory wasps or other types of predators that attack the animal eating the plant. And so the plant is sending a signal that's received by the enemy of its enemy. And so the amount that those crops get damaged goes down because it's called an associational defense. They're bringing in an army. Instead of making themselves more poisonous, they just bring in um, soldiers to, or, or predators of, of these things. And so in agriculture, there's efforts to make that a more effective system, maybe turn it on earlier to, to biotechnology sort of thing to enhance these natural behaviors that plants do. So it's a, it's a wide, wide open field right now. It is, um, I had a um, graduate student early on, and this is uh, maybe 2010 or so, who I thought was gonna be my least employable student ever. He was a PhD student um, and he not only studied plant behavior, but he was a theoretical plant behaviorist. In other words, he was doing the theory of a discipline we were just making up at the time. Um, and so he's, like, he's an expert in game theory um, and, 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 and this sort of thing. And he was immediately taken by Purdue University, which is one of the top ag schools in the world, into their ag department mm. because they realized this is the future of a lot of plant biology. It's coming up with new characteristics to explore in agricultural systems. Um, that's so cool. I mean, I, I feel like an idiot because after every, every um um, after everything you say, I say unbelievable or so cool. So just bear with me, but I'm just kind of, um, it's just very, very interesting. Uh, I wanted to kind of touch on that point that you made about plants attracting the predators of its predators. Uh, and I remember in, in my undergrad, I took some ecology course and the example used was a specific plant will do that when, when aphids attack. And, and so it'll, you know, when aphid is, right. is eating it, um, it'll make a, smell or whatever it is that attracts these wasps and then the, that eats the aphid and i just read somewhere i think that now uh it seems to be shown and i'm sure you'll correct me if i'm wrong that um if there's a nearby plant that isn't being attacked by aphids it will actually start to emit those defense chemicals in advance of an attack meaning that the plant that is being attacked is actually pre-warning the plants around it to say hey get ready for war here yep yeah, it, it's crazy. So that, that one, if I, I'll tell that story. It has a long story in ecology. Uh, there's a couple papers in the early 80s uh, that were giving hints that attack plants were giving information to unattacked plants, and these unattacked plants were changing their chemistry. They were preparing to be attacked. Um, and that got picked up uh, in the public media, not surprisingly, and they immediately called it talking trees. Um, and it was the, the first evidence that plants actually had airborne communication with other plants in a potentially adaptive way. Unfortunately, the underlying science was not very strong. There were some classical problems in design and a couple of very senior people in the field were very negative about these papers mm -hmm. to the point that they shut down this field of research for about 20 years. Um, and so nobody would touch it because of the negative response in the culture, of the, the scientific culture. And there was no plant biology that could explain it. Nobody had any idea how it could happen. And so it didn't make sense. The senior people said it doesn't happen and the physiologists can't explain how it could happen. In 2000, um, there's the next real study. So about 20 years later, showing this very conclusively in a forested system and there's been tons left. It's to the point now that it's normal for plants to communicate in the air, not an exception. That is, and tomato does it, cotton does it, tobacco does it, tons of common crop plants do this all the time. 
and and there's also this that eavesdropping is happening above ground as well so other species are tapping in to the signal and then changing their own defensive chemistry isn't this what's happening in like um in jasper or like how the the pine trees are dealing with the pine beetles i've heard like in uh, signaling to their like some of the mother plants are signaling to their offspring to strike up their defenses like i, I don't know i heard, I heard yeah. something from the u of a come out about that but yeah absolutely there's signaling uh, going on in the pine beetle attack there's also signaling among the beetles and so it's not just mm -hmm. the, the plants are protecting themselves um and where one of the areas that plant biology has really moved into in this last decade is realizing that above and below ground it's a world of communication in plants plants are talking not using words but using chemicals to everything to microbes to herbivores the things that eat them to predators uh, even to the predators of the predators and um it's extremely complex and, and this is actually a big function a part of my class that i'm teaching right now is I walk through the basics of communication, which came from radio communication and, and the emitter and the having a media of air. And, and it's easy to see how there's no reason plants shouldn't fall in this. All you need is some medium such as air and some chemical that can be produced and a receptor that can bind it. If you have that, that, that can be communication. It doesn't take magic. It's crazy, but it's, it's not even complicated biology. That's too, that's, yeah. Okay, I just come up with like a different word uh, than cool or, <laughs> or unbelievable, uh, like I suppose righteous or something. I don't know. Um, well, I, I feel you. Like I, I mean, I'm working in this field. I've seen it explode uh, in the, in, over the course of my career. Um, you know, a part of what we do in the lab is just think of like what's the craziest thing we could see if plants can do, and then we go test it. Um, and almost always they do it. Uh, and so it is, it's, it's like, okay, we, did, we had a study last year or the year before, we actually are showing that plants can have anticipatory responses. Like they can actually change foraging based on what's gonna happen. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and it, but it's only crazy because the last 200 years of plant biology, nobody asked these questions. Um, in 200 years, it's gonna be normal. Uh, can you speak to the role that uh, fungal networks play in this? Cause I know, um... One of the things I took away in from, you know, from my undergrad was the value of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And um, I have also heard that uh, these networks are being used for communication as well. Can you talk a little bit about what mycorrhizal fungi is and how and like what role that plays? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, it, mycorrhiza is an interaction between a fungus and a plant root. There's different types that involve different species of fungi. Um, most all plants on the planet form mycorrhiza. Um, but not with all fun fungal species. So there's lots of variation there. Um, and they're basically exchange centers. And so what seems to typically happen is uh, carbon from photosynthesis goes into the root system and it, it feeds the fungus. And the fungus is typically transporting phosphorus or nitrogen into the root systems. And so it's essentially, it's, it's modeled as an economic market or more or less carbon for soil nutrients. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. Um, the interesting bit in that whole system is that uh, different individuals of plants within and across species might be connected to the same exact fungus. Uh, and, and so you have these what we'll call hyphal networks, which is uh, this, this massive amount of fungal material in, in the soil floor that is interconnecting many of the plants that are in that system. And so uh, Suzanne Samard at UBC did uh, the first work on that, um, showing that there can be carbon flow from one species to another through the hyphae of the fungus. So one plant can, let's say, feed another plant through, through that fungal network. Um, and she and other people are also showing that they're, they're just another medium for signaling. Just like you can do volatile communications in the air, you can do other type of chemical communications through fungal hyphae. And so it's just a different way of communicating. Um, it's a tricky area though, I will say, and I'm, I'm, I don't, there's a lot more nuance to this and we've studied this one quite a lot. Um, mycorrhizae have historically been viewed as good for the plant. Uh, they're not necessarily. Many mycorrhizal fungi are parasites uh, and, and, or they're parasites under some conditions and beneficial as the others. Many species of plants do better with no fungus or only one type of fungus. And so there's actually, a, it's a big schmear of parasite to mutualist or beneficial. Oh. Uh, and it's very, very complicated with huge implications for agriculture. You, you see people just adding mycorrhizal inoculum 
to their gardens. And I, I tell my students every year, if, I, if you learn one thing from this class this year, do not go buy a random pack of mycorrhizae and put it on your parents' garden because you might be paying for parasites. Uh, and you have to really see the interaction. Um, and so it's, there's this idea that plants are sharing resources through these networks. Another way you could look at it is maybe every plant's just a parasite of other plants. Well, who says a plant is sharing with its neighbors? Why aren't the neighbors taking it, right? Uh, the data looks the same. And, and so your conceptualization of what's going on depends on you want to imply a positive intent of one plant towards another, or do you want to have a more natural selection, you know, Tennyson, red and tooth and claw sort of idea of things take from each other. So it, it's a very interesting field right now. And we're trying to sort this out. Very cool. Have you, uh, uh, GC, have you studied plant behavior in like permacultured systems? I have not. I've had a couple conversations with people, but nothing ever developed from that. Um, no. Uh, and I, well, I, I guess I guess where I'm kind yeah. of getting to is like um, when you talk about how some of these, and I'm not, I might not be phrasing these industries correctly, but when you think about these. Um, like the agricultural industry and biotech firms and stuff like that when they're trying like um, when they're trying to essentially mimic uh, some of the natural the, the some of the processes that are happening what you what you're uh, classifying sort of the natural the natural ecosystem or natural world into like um, the crop industry it's almost like it seems kind of backward to me in, in, in ways like I totally understand like their their the, the need for um, you know, croplands and, and big agriculture, but it's like, okay, we're trying to like figure out a, uh, we're trying to address a problem that where there's already a solution in the kind of the natural world. So is there a way to kind of, that's why I asked about permaculture, because is there, um, you know, people argue that you could farm at, you know, larger scales or you could, you know, feed the world in, 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 in more holistic, holistic and natural ways. And so I just trying to, I guess, um, kind of bridge the gap there, but. That's a really good question, and um, the effect of agriculture on natural systems, land-based habitat, or it's huge. There's there's nothing yeah. bigger that people have ever done. It, it it's way bigger than climate change. It's way bigger than anything else. I, absolutely, the land use uh, habitat change um, has been enormous, and it's why we don't have massive famines right now like we have before. And it is why we have this continued population growth. And it is why uh, we are able to eat beef and other secondary consumers in these systems because we have this agricultural foundation that is really good at producing food at cost, but they're really good at it. And, and we don't wanna lose my set of that, our, our mind of that. Um, and so it's, it's sort of these societal choices of what do you want to do. Uh, organic systems, when the studies are done, are typically about 25% less productive than conventional agriculture. Um, that's on average. It varies by crops and regions, but, but you, you don't get the same yields. Even more, you don't have the same necessary crop efficiency. And so a lot of the breeding in plants isn't about making the plants grow better. It's about making them be more synchronous in their timing so harvesting can be more effective and all of these other so they do everything at the same time so you can come in and harvest all your plants because they're all senescing at the same time and so we can't lose sight of the operational side of it um, I think that there is a lot that can be done in companion cropping and, and that uh, some, a lot of uh, uh, agriculture is moving towards more use of cover crops mm -hmm. uh, so a crop that or green fertilizer and a large reason behind that is actually what those cover crops are putting into the soil and changing the microbial network to a more beneficial one. And so mm -hmm. some of this is integrating it in different ways, mm -hmm. maybe not permaculture itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I, uh, there's just a lot of opportunity. If we know what the problem is that they're trying to solve, I think a lot of us could try to help come up with um, some examples of what might be selected for in a breeding program. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. I, I wonder for yourself, like, what you've learned so far about plant behavior, has that changed the way you eat or your approach to food in general in any way? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, it is, so there is a whole um, philosophical line of research that's going on right now too, not, not in my lab, but by philosophers. Um, and, and I've been part of some of those conversations and 
there's also some legal work that's being done uh, because it raises some very tricky questions. Um, uh, if, if a plant is able to make complex decisions and if a plant is able to integrate information and, and express behavioral choice, mm -hmm. where's the line of what does and doesn't get regulated? Um, and I don't think it's ever going to be that plants get regulated more. I have a feeling realistically it would be the other direction, that animals get regulated less. Uh, and so it's a tricky, it's a tricky argument. Um, I, I believe that behavior is normal. Um, everything does it. Uh, and it's because natural selection should promote it. And it doesn't take an intelligence, it doesn't take a brain, it doesn't take um, consciousness necessarily um, for natural selection to say, hey, this organism is able to find food really well. Let's get them having more offspring. This plant is really wasteful in its food. Let's kill them out. Like that's enough. And you do that, you've got behavior. Um, and, and the same for communication. This plant can call predators when it's being attacked. This plant can't. You know, it's, it's clear which one's going to be favored in the next generation. I'm making an assumption here, okay. but uh, do you have a garden? I hate gardening. <laughs> I, 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 so, my, my wife's been away, and she's coming back, and I just realized, oh my gosh, I haven't watered the plants for two months. <laughs> and so, so, so I have to do that oh, as soon as we're done here. Um, uh, I, I'm, I don't have a great green thumb in the lab. I say uh, for, for plants, death is the data point. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so it's, you know, plants are my job, right? That, that is I, day in, day out. I, I learn about plants and I love it. I love the stuff I do and I work technical details of growing plants. I, I, we do these massive experiments in the greenhouses and the fields. And that's just not leisurely for me. Sure. I like video games. I, I like tennis. I was just going to ask you. Well, so so first of all, I was hoping you'd say, yeah, I have a garden. And then I could say, what are some hot tips? Because I'm not very good at gardening. And then you would say, here's the four things I do. And then you would change my garden. So that didn't happen. So that's a huge bummer. Um, but I was going to ask you, too. So when you're not in the lab, when you're not washing roots, when you're not doing research, what kind of things do you do? Yeah, so... Um, between the uh, the two of us, we have uh, four kids from 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 two different marriages. Um, they're all adult um, now, and so they're they're spread throughout the country. Uh, so that doesn't take as much time as it did before, but that's still obviously a very important mm -hmm. thing. Um, I play a lot of tennis. I I played three hours this morning, um, and uh, it, and that's just a lot of fun. I've always been competitive. I'm a middle child. I played football. I studied plant competition historically. Now I call it plant behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I still like that friendly competitions thing. And, and so I do it that yeah. way. I do play video games. I I did since I was young. Mm -hmm. No reason to stop it. And, and I cook. I do a lot of cooking. Oh, nice. And so I, I, yeah. and so I do most of the cooking in the house and learning different approaches. And, and that's a lot of fun. What, so I, uh, what position uh, in uh, football did you play? I was a fullback and a linebacker. Oh. Basically, I ran into people in hard and <laughs> see what happens. All right. uh, I played football <laughs> until I was about. Uh, <laughs> was that? Um, I'm glad this is virtual. <laughs> uh, so I played football until I was about 20, uh, and I was a quarterback. Um, so we had very different roles. Uh, I always appreciated the fullbacks. I always hated the linebackers. Uh, where in the and and so you said that uh, you were from the states. Um, so I imagine that you played football in the states. I did, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 pl I went to a, a boarding school, actually, for high school, um, and, and I played there, and that was in Princeton, New Jersey. And then, then I, had, I blew out my knees in, in high school. And Both? So that ended. Uh, one in high school, the other one in college. I was then on the fencing team uh, and, uh, in college, which was a blast. It was a great sport. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I got the other knee in that one, but that's oh, okay. Man, no. that's late. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, uh, when you play tennis, are you more of a net presence guy or you hang back a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, pretty aggressive on the court. <laughs> uh, play a lot of doubles and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so as far as cooking goes, uh, it sounds like that's something that you're pretty interested in. What's for dinner tonight at the Cahill household? Or it's just you sounds like maybe cause your wife's gone. Yeah. My, my stepson's down there. It, uh, but I think he's getting himself something to eat until my wife comes back. And uh, 
I, I haven't, I realized I haven't thought about that. So I don't think it's going to be anything too special today. Okay. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll get it back in gear for when she comes back. All right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> when you are on your A-game cooking, what's the go-to meal? Yeah. What's the, or like one of your favorites to make? Well, I, I do a lot of uh, smoking meats. And so, you know, pulled porks, briskets, ribs, that sort of stuff, roasted chicken. Uh, that's always nice to do. But then it's, um, we eat a lot of fish. Um, and so lots of salmon and pretty typical blend of a rich mosaic of a country you know i like to cook a lot of vietnamese and thai and oh, nice. and, and and we don't we, we 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 don't really eat a lot of um uh carbohydrates and uh and my wife doesn't do gluten and, and dairy and so lots of creative stuff and it's been great it's been great to figure out how to navigate this dietary space and uh just the resources available are incredible and it's always fun to learn new new approaches and new techniques great thanks Kyle, these questions, man, at the time that we're recording this podcast is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Actually, I'm pretty hungry too. Um, and tonight we're making, uh, we have some lasagna in the oven. So I'm pretty excited about that. My wife made it, so it'll actually be good. But, uh, (laughs) um, so when you came from the States to Canada, um, are there things that you really miss from, uh, from the States? And if you were to leave Canada, say go back to the States, are there some things that you would really miss from Canada? Yeah, I, I don't have see any future of moving back to the U.S. Okay. Um, my, my wife's family is here in Edmonton. She's one of the very rare uh, uh, faculty members who actually gets the permanent job in their hometown. Okay. And her family's there, and, and, and it's great to have her family here. And, and I no desire to try to disrupt that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not a great time in the U.S. right now. My, my family's mm-hmm. spread out, and... Um, it's a very, I mean, it's hard here to see what's going on. It's, it's, I don't have any desire to put myself back in that presence. Um, I've also really, uh, I've been in Edmonton since 1999. I love it. This has been a great place to run a, fa- run a family. Mm-hmm. Uh, the access to natural spaces is incredible, mm-hmm. um, both inside and outside the city. Uh, this is, to me, a very low population density relative to living outside of New York City. Um, and so, yeah, still it's a city of a million people, but it's not the same as living, you know, in Philadelphia, yeah. surrounded by many, many millions or, or, any, or anywhere else. And I, when, every time I go back to visit, I realize, oh, my gosh, it's so stressful to be around that many people all the time. Mm. My oldest son lives in Toronto, and he loves it. He loved Manhattan, and, and so he's thriving in that world. But um, mm. I don't really have a desire to pick up a faster lifestyle. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with what I do and the speed at which I do it. And, yeah, I, I would just... I. I would. I always found Canada. It's generally just reasonable. It's not perfect. It's not always reasonable. But you know, and you know, we've seen some examples that's not not hasn't been the best for the country. But it's it's reasonable, and I think that's pretty good for a country. I like that. We're reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I hope that didn't come across as offensive. I meant that as a, no, as like no, a positive, no, just to be no. clear. <laughs> No, I just envision like you know we have city of champions for the city of Edmonton, but if there's like something for Canada as you enter the border, we're <laughs> yeah. I, I I love it. I do it. Yeah. Let's go. Um, yeah. So what are some things? And sorry, I uh, I I took us a little off off topic there for about fifteen minutes. Um, what are some things that get you really really excited that are kind of on the horizon in your field? Uh, some things that. Um, that you might have to dumb down for a guy like me to understand, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, one of them isn't a research topic, but I'm finding undergraduates and early graduate students are talking about plant behavior now earlier. Like they're, they were aware of this discipline. And so all of a sudden there's this, Oh, could we look at, and so there's, I don't have to have these conversations of, I know it sounds funny, but, right? There's this, people are understanding what's happening. And so it's building this critical mass of just this incredibly diverse and new group of people who are asking questions that really haven't been asked. And so it's all these great ideas are floating around, which is, which is really great. Uh, on the specific ones, um, I have one student who's working with flax. Uh, and because uh, uh, the genomics are well known and, and she's trying to look at this evolution of behavior in flax to see if it's been bred out. So she's trying to explore this blend between crop biology, but also evolutionary biology and, and, and plant behavior. And I think it's potentially very cool. Um, and we can see where that will go. Um, I, I am hopeful to have a student coming on this summer and, and she will um, 
so like I said before, we tend to focus on resources as like a currency. You, if I take it, you don't get it. Um, but a lot of what we're showing actually is that resources are not only essential for plant growth, they're also cues, they're information. They're telling plants what's going on in that environment. And so resources have this dual role of stimulating behavioral responses, which might be changing your roots, as well as a consumptive need. And so the student this summer is gonna start playing around with trying to differentiate these resource as cues from resources as essential elements uh, and sort of see what is it that plants are really responding. And, and, and that one is get, does get technical, um, but I personally think that we've way overplayed the role of limiting resources and we've underplayed the idea that the distribution of resources in the soil is like a, a map of information uh, and then that plants are making decisions for more than just uh, nutritional needs. But we'll see how it goes. I could be completely wrong. <laughs> That's okay. Then we'll do something else. <laughs> those, those are the ones coming to, to my mind right away. Uh, but we do also have a nice one of students working on now that we're struggling with a little bit, but we have preliminary evidence that um, when a plant gets stressed, it starts making bad behavioral decisions. So that one's pretty cool. We're trying to replicate that study. So just like humans, where under stress, we can't, we, we literally can't make good decisions. We're actually seeing that plants aren't able to make good foraging decisions when they've been stressed relative to non-stress, and which would be pretty cool if it's, if it's real, but we gotta, we gotta replicate the study. It's, I know I could publish it now, but it's too out there, and I just wanna make sure that we're right. So we're having, I'm having a different person do it just to, to you know, just for scientific integrity. Sure. Is there, is there a difference between, and you, you and I had uh, email exchanges about, uh, a brief exchange about plant intelligence, right? Like when you, when you describe these things um, about how plants communicate, how they behave with each other. Maybe, and I, and I, I just want to make sure I capture you capture your position or your thoughts on this. But I think I, uh, when I read your email, you said that um, there's kind of a difference between plant intelligence and maybe you you don't necessarily um, the evidence doesn't show that that exists. If I if I'm understanding you correctly, can you talk about that because when to, to novel and naive ears, when I hear about what you talk, how you're describing plants and how they exchange information, to me that sounds like, yeah. that sounds intelligent, but maybe talk about that. Yeah, th yeah that, that's a good question. And um, this has a deep history in this discipline as well. And so there are some early studies, sort of the data-driven studies, which is what I did and some other people did. And then there was a correlated body of work um, that sometimes included data, but also often was more opinion and speculative and, and focused on plant intelligence, uh, plant sentience, and a variety of these other concepts. And that got really ugly in the literature. Like it was very, it, we're, we're scientists. I, I, I wouldn't say we're like the most socially adjusted people as a random subpopulation. So <laughs> it's not surprising that we get into these tips. Um, but anyway, and, and so it was pretty ugly, and, and I chose to stay out of that fight uh, because I didn't see any possible win. Uh, there's no way biologically you're ever going to show intelligence because I know philosophers can't define it. Uh, you, they, you can't even define behavior. Even within the field of animal behavior, there's not agreement on what behavior is and what behavior isn't. And so these are inherently philosophical questions, important questions. Mm -hmm. And I agree, a pattern of actions by organisms that are parallel to a pattern of actions of other organisms that we call intelligent might suggest intelligence, but mm. it's not a science problem. That, that's a philosophy problem. Okay. And, and let's let philosophers do the philosophy, and I'll keep helping them know what, what natural biology is saying, but, but they're, they're the experts in that field. But not all biologists take that role. And so the approach I've taken in my lab and why I feel some of my work has been effective in advancing the science of this field is I just use the words that make sense, that are non-inflammatory, unless I can back them up. Um, and, and so for instance, my use of the word behavior, it really wasn't as simple as me just saying, I'm gonna do it, what are they gonna do? It was, I'm actually taking the models developed by animal behaviorists and literally testing them in plants and finding that plants are doing what the models predict. Okay. And so, what, so my interpretation there is either plants are exhibiting behavior or these are not behavioral models because they explain what plants are doing too. 
And so, so I've been really focused on trying not to speak outside of evidence. Uh, and so that's why I don't call them intelligent. I, I honestly don't know if they're intelligent or not. They sure as heck do a lot of stuff. I don't think animals are that intelligent. And I, I've had lots of teenagers. And, and so I, I, I don't, I, I, I do know talking to some behavioral, uh, animal behaviorists, they often infer cognition and intelligence, right? Mm. It's, it's not usually quantifiable. Mm. So if I'm here, okay, so if I understand this correctly, then the fact that the word intelligent or intelligence doesn't necessarily have a clear definition or it kind of is still in that uh, the realm of a philosoph philosophical discussion um, in terms of how it, you've just chosen not to use that to kind of guide your research because in terms of behavior, you can, you can um, connect your work to proven models that that really define what behavior looks like and okay i think is that, yeah that's, is that that's right? exactly right okay. is it's uh, yeah i i i feel my job i'm an experimental biologist yeah. and i feel i can do that pretty well and uh I, if i stay down that lane i think i can contribute more to the larger conversation mm. than jumping in too much on a uh, on a purely philosophical thing but other people are and, and we do talk to each other so i mean it, it's not this isn't being explored it's just it's it's outside of my specialty. Mm. Mm. Uh, do you find uh, so you said earlier in your academic career you wanted to be a philosophy major and then go to med school? Uh, do you find that your interest in philosophy influences your scientific approach? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, it, it it was really infor uh, influential. So I went to this liberal arts college 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 called Trinity College, small school, two thousand people. Um, and it was a classic American liberal arts college where uh, you, I designed my own major. And so what I did for my major was a combination of philosophy, anthropology, and biology. Mm -hmm. But I still wanted to go to medical school, so I also mirrored the biology program. So I ended up with a double major, uh, qualifying for both of those degrees. And, and they said at the, when, before I graduated, hey, you can either get a Bachelor's of Arts or a Bachelor's of Science. You've qualified for both. And so I actually have a Bachelor's of Arts. I don't have a Bachelor's of Science. Uh, and because I really felt that that side was so influential and I was gonna have a career in science. I didn't need to give credentials for an undergraduate training in science. And in the philosophy I took, um, I, there was a lot of um, evolutionary psychology, which used to be called sociobiology, which is really the evolutionary basis of a lot of human behavior. And I took a lot of classes and wrote a lot on those sorts of things and it really was influential in helping me um, link behavior to selection rather than to organisms um, and it letting evolutionary uh, natural selection be the engine of a lot of behaviors and then that makes it easy to transplant to plants because if your focus on behavior is animals do behavior that's a huge leap but if your focus is natural selection causes behavior well, that can apply to anything. Mm. And so I think that philosophical training early on made it easier for me to accept things that were um, not in the norm of the paradigm of the day. Awesome. Philosophy is helpful. I know, I know it's not what people often think, but philosophical training, I think, is great for everyone in any career. And I encourage anybody who's listening, don't dismiss it. Take, take a few classes and dabble. Yeah, we um, we haven't talked about philosophy too much on this podcast, but we have talked about um, I've uh, um, meditations by Marcus Aurelius a little bit, and then some of the Stoics and their works. And I, I mean, that's that's really my you know, my only a, a, um, exposure to it. But it's pretty interesting. It's, it's it's nice to it's funny to read something that was written thousands of, or you know you know so long ago, whatever that timeline looks like, and have it resonate today and still be true today, and you know, you know open up different doors of perspectives on the way you look at things. And I found it to be really rewarding to read that stuff. But I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's so funny. He is literally number one on my five for dinner list. Oh, there you go, man. There Boom, go. bingo. Really nice. Yeah, that's good. I I, uh, I think you might have been on my list too um, when we did this episode a while ago. Very cool. Yeah, I, I find his writing and learning about the Stoics, my wife and I have both been doing that quite a bit the last few years, and I I, I, I just find it really rewarding. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's changing my perspective. I, 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 think I'm, I'm, I think it's helping me in life in a, in a very positive way. Awesome. Well, we're... 
Well, we're going to get to that five for dinner question. <laughs> uh, I have a couple more, Kyle. I don't know if, how many, if you had a few questions there too, but I was going to ask you, um, Casey, we, Kyle and I, you know, we're relatively new dads. I mean, I feel maybe we've got a few years now that we're maybe getting the hang of this. I don't know. But, now uh, still feels new. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, but is there anything that you take away? I mean, your dad of, I think you said you got four, right? Yeah. yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And <clears throat> is there anything you take away from your research and from plant behavior that you can kind of draw into parenting? Or is that a bit of a no. stretch? <laughs> <laughs> but what I can say it's just is... Uh, podcast right here. No, no, yeah, no, next question. But, but, yeah. but the kids were help, really helpful in me deciding how I was going to approach being a practicing scientist. Mm. And so academic world, we're busy, like really, really busy. Mm. The, we're stretched in so many different dimensions, and people always want, you know, answers to things, which is great. Um, and, and students need those assignments, you know, graded. And, and uh, summers are busier, not lighter, right? It's like, like our load period is when we're teaching. Um, our research period is busier. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to understand that until you're in an academic environment of realizing how, much, how many things profs have to do. And many of us get into that system and we just get eaten up. Um, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no external validation. Because, and there's no sense of accomplishment. You got this paper, great. Where's the next one? Right. Yeah. You got that, great. What's next? And, and and it's we're all super motivated people. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten these jobs in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so we always want to do the most we can. Mm -hmm. And and it eats you up. It's absolutely brutal unless you adapt to it. Mm -hmm. And so where the kids help me, rather than my research helping me with the kids, is helping me make these decisions early in my career of these were going to be, most of the time, my work hours. And I was going to do what I can in the time I'm gonna allot. And I'm gonna try really hard to be a productive citizen at the university, and I feel I have. And, and so for most of my kids' um, elementary schools, I was the one who picked them up every day mm -hmm. at three o'clock for school. And you know made dinner and all this sort of stuff. But, and then I worked at other times, but I, I didn't work on weekends, almost ever, mm -hmm. um, unless I really had to for a grant deadline. And, and I have no regrets. It, it's, I, I, I'm really happy to do it, and it's not easy to do. And I know lots of my colleagues struggle with this. Mm. Um, and I couldn't imagine having young kids right now during COVID and this job. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would say that's the blend between my family and the research rather than the other way around. Mm. I, I, I appreciate the <laughs> sort of save there on my, on my question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wonder, uh, okay, I'm gonna ask something else, but I, I, maybe there's a no to this one too. Um, is is there anything telling about plant behavior and how humans in general should coexist with each other? Yeah, I, I see a little bit more than that. And and just to be clear, I wouldn't have just said no <laughs> unless I had something to follow up. <laughs> but I also had to give you a taste of my early Americanism. Right? Let me just okay. be direct. So, okay. um, I I think that it's this issue of complexity that everything actually is connected. And it's not necessarily in the way we've always think, think they are. And I don't think it's as simple as positive or negative. It's this, everything is this mix of things that are helping and hurting and indifferent. And the, how it overall impacts the organism is really dependent on what's going on around that set of species. And I think that's the same that we see in humans is we don't really have a lot of good and evil. We have, you know, people making some good choices and some bad choices. These choices are informed by opportunity but or lack of opportunity and local context. And that maybe if we see that um, nuance is normal in nature, maybe that we could polarize a little bit less in some cases. Mm, I like mm. that last part, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um, I just have one question, and then I think we can probably get to our final questions here. Um, you had mentioned earlier that uh, it was in the 80s or 90s that um, some evidence had come out that uh, plants could communicate, but the science was, was sort of poor. And then there was some very influential people in the scientific community who sort of blacklisted that topic. And that really impacted the ability to kind of research those topics for years to come. Um, I'm wondering how often something like that happens in a scientific community and how much of an influence something like that has on, on the scientific community and what's being studied and discovered. Is it significant or is it not that much of a problem somewhere in between? It's very significant. Um, I, I, I go through a lot of examples in my classes that um, 
academic science is often full of very strong people. Um, and it's now a pretty big area of work, but it didn't always be. Mm -hmm. And so strong personalities in a small community can have outsized impacts. And um, like every other discipline, uh, we're realizing that maybe we don't have to create a hostile workplace. Maybe we could actually try to impose and adopt practices that actually are inclusive and that actually are fair. Mm -hmm. And it's not at the cost of advancement, but instead it actually enhances advancement and understanding. And so all of us have been going through these changes. And when I started in the world of plant competition, it was a huge field and it was full of people like me. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> At that, I'm much better now. It was a very aggressive conferences and stuff. And um, it, that for no good, there's no gain, it, right? That it, it, I realize now it's pure selfishness and, and self-aggrandizing. And, and it's much nicer to disagree, but actually discuss and then move on and, and, and learn. And yeah, so my field of plant ecology is full of examples that research disciplines get shut down for decades or more until strong personalities move away, one way or the other. Interesting insight, thank you. So final questions, Rupesh, you wanna hit them with it? Sure, uh, so we usually ask these questions to all of our guests, so thanks for entertaining us on these ones. Um, so our five for dinner question, dead or alive, who would be five people that you'd want to have to have a meal with? I mean, and do, if you want to uh, let us know whether they'd be individual or together, um, Kyle's had a little bit of a twist on what would you serve or what what food as would you a, yeah. if you if, as if a you cook, you know, smoke some meat to yeah, cook, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So go for it. That's what do you a, think? That's a good one. Yeah, I thought about it. So I, I mentioned the the Marcus Aurelius. Uh, I, I, I just find his writing so influential and and it would be interesting to learn about um, who he is as a person, not just as the history of the person. Mm. Uh, he might be a standalone. Uh, the next three might be together. It would be uh, so I, I put E.O. Wilson, Robert MacArthur and Rachel Carson. These mm. are three science people. So E.O. Wilson is, is certainly the person who popularized the idea of biodiversity. He just recently passed away. Um, uh, He's an old school biologist, who, uh, incredibly smart. Robert MacArthur was a foundational ecologist at the birth of community ecology in the 60s, and he passed away in his 30s, and he has had a deep legacy, and it would be uh, really a, a great thing to be able to talk to him. Um, and Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, uh, was really sort of the really initially popularized um, environmentalism, and she was a scientist herself, and so in these early days before academics were actually moving into advocacy, it'd be really interesting to learn from her um, uh, about how that worked and, and what that was like in that system. Mm -hmm. And then the last one would probably be a separate conversation. Uh, that would be my mother from 20 years ago. Mm. She's not doing great and it'd be nice to talk to her then about what's going on now. Mm. So thank Sorry you for sharing that. With, no, yeah, thank yeah, you very no, much. Um, our last question is beyond the circle of life. What do you know for sure? <laughs> um, what I have is I, I feel better when each day I work hard to be helpful. That, at the end of the day, that's been a good day for me. Excellent. That, yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, JC, thank you so much for, for joining yes. us today. Thank you for uh, accepting our cold email invitation there. <laughs> and uh, we'll no to, problem. willing to join us on our show today. Uh, we'll put all of JC's uh, info in, in our show notes and uh, link you to his site. And just hopefully people will tune into this and uh, just appreciate you again, JC, for joining us. Hopefully you had a good time. And I know Kyle and I, we learned a ton. Or yeah. Is, uh, Kyle yeah. might want to use one of your catchphrases. Unbelievable. <laughs> there you go. Well, this. Yeah. Thank you both very much. I really appreciated that conversation. That was a nice way to spend the afternoon. Thanks, awesome. Okay. Take care.